Margo, I teach astronomy and planetary sciences at UCLA, and I study the formation and evolution of habitable worlds, planets like our own that can sustain life. Just a few weeks ago, I was in Yosemite with a number of UCLA students, and we stopped after sunset to admire the night sky. And the photo on the left was taken by one of the students as we were contemplating our connection to the universe. The calcium in our bones comes from the violent death of a previous generation star. And as Carl Sagan said, we are made of star stuff. As we continued the stargazing, we noticed that the region of the sky almost directly overhead um, is the part of the sky that the Kepler Space Telescope has been staring at for the past three years near the constellation Cygnus. And Cygnus is shown right here in red. And the Kepler field is located just to the right of the upper wing. Now, Kepler uses 42 CCD cameras, much like the camera in your smartphone, to continuously record the light from 100,000 stars in a region of the sky that's about 10 degrees by 10 degrees. That's about the size of your fist at arm's length. And the primary goal of the Kepler mission is to measure the abundance of planets around other stars, and in particular, the abundance of terrestrial type planets, planets like our own that can sustain life. Some of you were fortunate enough to observe the transit of Venus on June 5th, 2012. This was a very exciting event, and it's a perfect illustration for how the Kepler telescope works. When a planet passes in front of a star, in this case, Venus in front of the sun, the total amount of light from the star is diminished by a small fraction. And Kepler records these light variations to infer the presence of planets around stars. For an Earth-sized planet passing in front of a, of a star like the sun, this is just the amount of dimming of light that we would obtain because Venus and Earth are very comparable in size. So if you've ever wondered about the size of your home planet with respect to the sun, this is a great illustration. Now, we have used the Kepler data in my research group to study the architecture of planetary systems. And we found that most planetary systems are very closely aligned, that the orbits of the planets are lined up in a geometry that is somewhere between that of a crate and a pancake. <laughs> Extremely flat system. We've also found that most planetary systems are filled to capacity. They're full, sold out like this event tonight. If you add one more planet, the whole system goes unstable and one or two planets gets ejected. Now, these are very exciting findings about the Kepler data, but the most exciting finding from the Kepler data has to do with the abundance of uh, planets in the galaxy. Kepler has shown that a very substantial fraction of stars have planets. And the most abundant type of planets are planets like Earth. And you can see this in this diagram that shows the fraction of stars that have Jupiter-type planets and the fraction of stars that have Earth-like planets. In fact, the fraction of stars that have Earth-like planets is at least 25%. And that means that in our galaxy alone, there are hundreds of billions of planets like Earth. A hundred billion planets. What does that number mean? That means if you were counting them at a rate of about one per second, one, two, three, it would take about 3,000 years to complete the count. And that is just in our galaxy alone. There are hundreds of billions of galaxies out there, all of which have hundreds of billions of stars and planets. To get a sense for the number of stars and planets in the observable universe, you need to picture yourself going to the Santa Monica beach and counting every grain of dry sand on the beach. Can you picture yourself doing that? <laughs> now you need to picture yourself repeating the task on every beach on Earth, because the number of planets in the observable universe is comparable to the number of dry grains of sand on all the beaches on Earth. So we have planets, and lots and lots of them. But which planets are habitable? Which planets can sustain life? In our solar system, we know the answer. There are eight planets, at least one of them, sustains life. There are four solid planets, and one of them sustains life. What the fraction is for the average planetary system out there, we don't know. But what we do know is that even if the fraction is very small, let's say one in a thousand, or even one in a million, there are still billions 
the habitable world. And not that we should restrict ourselves to planets either. Here's a family portrait of some of the worlds of the solar system. And there's some satellites that are suitable for life possible. Titan, for instance, the largest satellite of Saturn, has a nitrogen-rich atmosphere, much like Earth. There are lakes and rivers of hydrocarbon on Titan. Another satellite that may offer a prospect for life is Europa, a satellite of Jupiter. Here is a Galileo spacecraft image of Europa. It is an amazing world with an icy shell that is full of cracks that may open and close as a result of tidal action. There's very strong evidence that there's a subsurface ocean under the icy shell. And that ocean may provide a suitable habitat for certain life forms. The major question about Europa's astrobiological potential has to do with the thickness of the ice shell. Is it a mile or a few miles thick, or is it tens of miles? And today, I'll be using a few of Earth's largest radio telescopes to try to answer that question. Now, the search for life focuses on environments that have liquid water. And the reason for that is that water has a set of chemical and physical properties that make it an excellent solvent for the long molecules of life, such as the ones in your DNA. Life requires these long complex molecules to encode and transmit all of the information that's necessary to build life's machinery. And these molecules are much easier to assemble in a liquid medium. Now, how easy is it to build life building blocks with these long complex molecules? Turns out it's fairly easy. Here's a diagram of a set of experiments that was first conceived in the 1950s by Stanley Miller and Harold Urey, uh, and we call it the primordial soup experiment. It's a very simple setup. You can do this in your kitchen. Okay, here's the recipe. You take a flask and you fill it up with uh, very simple chemical elements, hydrogen, water, methane, ammonia, all of which are very abundant in the universe. And then you provide a source of energy, any kind of energy. It could be hot rocks, electric sparks, cosmic rays, UV light, you name it. You let it simmer, and within a week, voila, building blocks of life. Over 20 of life's essential amino acids are manufactured without intervention in an environment that is probably found in numerous places in the universe. In fact, these amino acids are found everywhere. They're found in interstellar space, and they're found in meteorites that rain down on our planet. Here's an image of the fireball that accompanied the fall of a primitive meteorite in Gold Rush Country near Sacramento in April of this year. There was a lot of excitement about recovering fragments of this meteorite. And I flew up there within days of the fall to participate in the search. The prospect of finding a 4.6 billion year old piece of rock filled with the stuff of life was just too enthralling to resist. And you too can hold a 4.6 billion year piece of rock in your hand tonight, thanks to Professor Ed Young. <laughs> we are very fortunate to live in a universe where hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen are abundant. And in our universe, the laws of physics allow for the formation of an abundance of stars and planets. And the laws of chemistry allow for the formation of these building blocks of life. So you can easily envision starting from the Big Bang and ending up with the formation of planetary systems and long complex molecules of life. So it's not unreasonable to ask, is there life elsewhere? And is there intelligent life elsewhere? In fact, I would argue it's not unreasonable to think that the universe is teeming with life. Now, there's something important to understand about the possibility of civilizations elsewhere. If we map the history of the universe onto a one-year calendar, with the Big Bang starting at the beginning on January 1st, then Earth would arise in early September, Dinosaurs would become extinct on December 30th, and Mother Newman's would rise in the last two minutes of the last day on December 31st on this one-year calendar. We acquire our technology or ability to send and receive radio signals in the last second on the last day of this one-year calendar. 
Now imagine we establish contact with another civilization. How likely is it that they also acquire their technology in that one second of that one year calendar? It's extremely unlikely. In fact, the odds are about one in a quadrillion. It is much more likely that they acquired their technology some other time on this one year calendar, maybe thousands of years before we did, maybe millions of years before we did. So we have the potential of establishing contact with a civilization that is far, far more advanced than we are. Imagine what we could learn. Imagine the possibilities. Now, is it reasonable to think that we can establish contact? Well, in fact, it is. A simple calculation shows that with the largest telescope on Earth, the 1,000-foot Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico, we could communicate over a very sizable fraction of the galaxy, anywhere between 1,300 to 13,000 light years. That is a very substantial part of the galaxy with billions of stars and planets. So clearly, even with our primitive technology, we have the potential of establishing contact. Now, what are we doing about it? There are currently no federally funded programs to support the search for an extraterrestrial intelligence. There are private efforts, and you can contribute to the search with computer resources or financial resources. Now, there's an apparent paradox here with the idea of a universe teeming with life and the fact that we have absolutely no evidence of an extraterrestrial civilization. If they are so advanced, wouldn't they have colonized the galaxy by now and made their presence known? This is called the Fermi Paradox after Enrico Fermi who first uh, enunciated it. And there are several ways to resolve the paradox. The first possibility is that we do live in a cosmic desert, that we are alone. This doesn't seem consistent with the numbers that I've described today, but we cannot rule out this possibility, at least not yet. The second possibility is that there's some kind of wall, some kind of barrier to colonization. Maybe there's technological difficulties. Space travel is very difficult. Or maybe there are sociological considerations that prevent colonizing the galaxy. And finally, it's possible that civilizations self-destruct before they reach the stage at which they can colonize the galaxy. There's a third possibility to the Fermi paradox. And that is that civilizations are indeed abundant, but that they're not making themselves known. No matter how you resolve the paradox, I think the balance is in uh, the sense for searching and to pursue what could be the greatest discovery of all time, the discovery of life on another world. And if it is intelligent life, access to their intelligence, and their wisdom. Now, the possibility that civilization self-destruct or that we could damage our home planet should give us pause. As Carl Sagan said, we are the legacy of 15 billion years of cosmic evolution. We have a choice. We can enhance life and come to know the universe that made us, or we can squander our 15 billion year heritage in meaningless self-destruction. What happens in the first second of the next cosmic year depends on what we do here and now with our intelligence and our knowledge of the cosmos. Thank you.